Hello, welcome back to Mining Network. I'm joined today by Eugene Lee, the CFO of Guiani Metals, and we're at the mining investment event of the North here in Quebec City. Eugene, good to see you. Good to see you. Kick things off very briefly. Market cap, ticker, wait, where are you? What's the company? Sure. The name of the company is Guiani Metals Corp. Our market cap is around $75 million Canadian. Our ticker is EMM, um, it's short for electro electrolytic manganese metal, uh, which we are not producing and we're listed on the TSX Venture Exchange. Something else we like to do just to begin with is actually management team background. It's obviously sure. a very important aspect for investors looking at a project. Would you mind briefly, what's your background and perhaps some of the other management team? So uh, I'm a chartered accountant in Canada. I've previously been involved with both public and private enterprises in the mining sector. I've been involved with precious metals and base metals. Uh, formerly the VP finance of a company called Northgate Minerals, which had the Young Davidson gold mine in uh, Northern Ontario and the Fosterville gold mine in uh, Australia. We were acquired for those assets. Mm -hmm. um, I was also the CFO of a private uh, royalty and streaming company, which I helped take public. And uh, then we were subsequently acquired by a larger uh, royalty and streaming company called Sandstorm Gold. Yeah. And most recently, I was the head of commercial for Hud Bay Minerals Corporation, um, in charge of all of our commercial marketing and sales of our concentrates, our metals in uh, copper, zinc, and molybdenum. A lot of mining background then. Good. A lot of mining, commercial, and finance background, yeah. Okay, so let's actually look at Guiani Metals. What, what can you tell us about the project at the moment? What stage are you? What can you tell us about the actual deposit in terms of what it looks like? Sure. What's in the ground? So our flagship asset is the Cahill Battery Manganese Project in Botswana. Um, it is a high-grade uh, manganese oxide deposit that we're currently doing a feasibility study on. The grade of our deposit is about just shy of 20% manganese oxide. So it is, the, it is the highest grade deposit amongst our peer group. Um, we are currently working on a feasibility study that we're intending to release by Q3 of 2022. Uh, but we also have some other prospects in country in Botswana, including at Otse and Lobatse. I'd say we've done some exploration drilling on and we've been uh, very encouraged by the drill results that we've seen. We have a number of holes that exceed over 30% of manganese oxide at over 10 meters, uh, 10 meters of width. So uh, we're, we're incredibly excited to see what uh, future prospects um, we can get from our pipeline assets in country. Okay, and just to, just to touch on the pipeline very quickly, because yeah. um, I do want to go on a bit more depth into the main asset. Sure. But um, what's their proximity to the, to the core asset? Are they are they intended to be satellites, or are these completely new assets that you'll have to build new infrastructure? They've all seen some previous um, mining on in in the past, but they're all within trucking distance of where we intend the plant to go. Brilliant. Otse is about 40 kilometers from our Cahill, our flagship Cahill deposit, mm -hmm. and Lobatse is another 40 kilometers away, and it's actually within it's within a stone's throw of the South African border. Okay. Yeah. And with the core asset, um, what can, what's the size of the deposit, and how much are you, obviously you released a PEA, so you, so you should have some idea in terms of what sort of production numbers would you eventually be looking at with the current size of the deposit? Sure. The initial maiden resource on the Cahill was 1.3 million tons of inferred. Um, we've since grown that to almost uh, quadruple. It's uh, 2.1 million tons of indicated at 19.3% manganese oxide mm -hmm. and 3.1 million tons of inferred resource at about 16% uh, manganese oxide. We've completed our infill drilling on uh, the inferred so that we're uh, hoping to be able to upgrade that into indicated uh, sometime later this year. In terms of expansion, is, is it open along the strike? Or is it open at depth? Is, is there room for growth or are you happy with the size that it is at the moment? You know, we've been very happy with the success that we've had with the drill yep. bit. It remains open um, at, uh, at the southerly extension. Yep. Um, so we're, gonna, we're going to be doing some additional drilling to see if there's additional pockets of manganese there. And uh, we expect that uh, we'll continue to see success at the Cahill. More importantly, economics, yeah. how does this actually shape up at the moment? How, how did the PA turn out? Let's yeah. Post-tax numbers sure. preferred. Yeah. So uh, the PA was incredibly exciting when we saw the numbers. We have an indicated IRR of 80% wow. on a project uh, startup CapEx of $160 million Canadian. It was prepared by SRK mm -hmm. uh, and the MPV with a 10% discount rate was about $440 million. Wow. So that was based on a high purity uh, manganese sulfate monohydrate price of $15.88 a ton. We were very conservative in the pricing that we used. We wanted to be able to control what we can control, which is the operating cost and the, and the capex. So we used a very conservative price. Now we know that the price of the material right now is selling well in excess of uh, the $15.88 that we use in our PEA. 
uh, in the feasibility study, we're going to be using a price that's uh, that's likely double, maybe closer to three thousand dollars a ton uh, for the uh, the product. But uh, we're also expecting the capex to increase as well. We've all seen in, in our daily lives and our you know, flights and our hotels and whatever it is in life and our gasoline fuel prices. There's been cost creep. We've seen cost escalation and everything, um, but we're also seeing that on the pricing side as well. So. We're expecting our margins to remain around where they were, around 65% plus. So the feasibility study that you're working on at the moment, when, when's that actually due? We're announcing that it should be expected by the market by the end of Q3 uh, of this year. We've already started to see some of the sections that we're starting to proof internally before we pass it off to our board for final approval. We're going to do it in stages so that it's not all coming out, coming to everyone at once. And is it, I assume, like most other jurisdictions, once you've got the feasibility, can you then start the permitting process? Is that, is that the plan? Or? So once we have the feasibility study, in conjunction with the feasibility study, we'll be working on our ESIA permitting or environmental permitting in country. Mm -hmm. Once that is complete, we'll be allowed to apply for a mining license, which we ent anticipate completing both the ESIA this year, as well as the mining license application this year. I, I don't know if you've been to Botswana, but it's a fantastic jurisdiction. We've been there a number of times. Um, and every time we go, we've had the opportunity to meet with government. We've met with the Minister of uh, the Mines Department. We've also had uh, closed door sessions with the President. And they are very keen in some of the questions, that, one of the questions that they continually ask us is, why haven't you applied for your mining license application yet? When are we going to see it? And our answer is, when it's ready. We want it to be right. We need to, there are certain things we know we need to do. We just haven't been there yet, and we're getting closer to, to that stage. And, so we expect to, to be able to do all of that by the end of this year. How long does the permit take, actually, before we move on to, to actually get through once you submit them? Is there a rough timeline? The statute in Botswana indicates that they need to respond within three months. Okay. We do not think it will be as prompt as, yeah. as the statute uh, indicates. But So we've, we've built in a more conservative number in terms of when the uh, actual license will be granted. So in an ideal scenario, Q3, you'll have your feasibility study, you'll be potentially by the end of this year, early next year, you may be in a position to make a construction decision, potentially? There's a few steps that need to be, uh, that need to, be to happen before then. Yep. We're also going to be uh, starting construction of a demonstration plant in South Africa. The demonstration plant has three purposes. One, it's gonna prove that our process flow sheet works at scale. Yep. Two, it's gonna be able to provide the samples that the off-takers need to qualify the material. And three, it'll be a, a training tool for operational stuff in Botswana. Right. The demonstration plant and the product that we produce will validate the spec that we've shared with our potential off-takers. Once that step is through, we're gonna continue our discussions with uh, potential off-takers uh, and other interested parties, um, and then we'll work towards the funding and the fundraising of the project through 2023. Mm -hmm. um, and hopefully by the end of 2023, we'll be able to come to a, a construction decision, a final investment decision. And how are you funded at the moment? Is there are you well funded enough to, to carry out this demonstration plant and, and get the studies done and, and the permitting work done? Yeah, in, in the, you know, in the 12 months from December 2020 to December 2021, we raised $30 million Canadian um, in three rounds of financing. Um, so that was to see us through to the end of 2022. It was to fund the feasibility study costs as well as the construction of the demonstration plant. Um, we have seen cost creep. In, in all aspects. We've also seen scope changes. Um, we've seen a lot more potentially interested off-takers that have come to us and asked us for samples. So if we kept the original scope of the demonstration plant that we had intended, it would have taken us a lot longer to produce the quantity of samples that we would require uh, for, uh, for off-takers to, to qualify. So we've increased the scope of it. We've actually last week announced that we've now put a down payment on our second crystallizer for the demonstration plant. So we announced the first one earlier this year uh, and we had an option to acquire a second one. We now know that uh, that the, the lead time for crystallizers uh, with all the interest in battery metals has increased as well and the cost has come up. So we feel very fortunate that we've had, we have the capital uh, and we had the ability to, to secure not only one, but two crystallizers for a demonstration plant. Right. So we are financed for 2022 uh, we also have some warrants that are in the money right now. We have about 19 million warrants that expire on Thursday of this week that uh, are currently in the money. Um, if those are all exercised, 
that'll bring an additional $7 million into our treasury. So that would be helpful. If they are not exercised because we're at a, a share price right now that's close to the, uh, to the exercise price, I think it'll take away some of the drag or remove some of the drag and the overhang that we've seen in the share price um, because, these, uh, because of these warrants. Let's look a bit more into the corporate profile as well. So in terms of your actual capital structure, maybe you talk to us about what major shareholders you might have uh, who are supporting you. Um, just a general general glance at that. Sure. So our largest shareholders is a, is a group called Rab Capital, yep. uh, based in the UK. And they've been very uh, supportive of us um, for a number of years, and we're integral in keeping the company afloat uh, when we were when we were a smaller, less known uh, manganese sulfate development company. Um, management owns about three percent of the company, and we've got other small mid cap. Uh, firms that you might uh, expect to see. We have uh, groups like Ixios, Charleston Capital, um, Osbill, uh, Century. So there's a number of decent names that uh, you would be familiar with in the mid-cap, small-cap space. Just looking at, I guess, the last year that you've had, the last 12 months, is there anything in particular that you're, you're particularly proud of that the company in terms of milestones have reached? Well, there's a number of them. Certainly being able to raise $30 million um, in the public market uh, is a notable achievement. We're, we're happy that we were able to raise money when it was available not and not when we absolutely needed it, right? I think it's it, the best time to raise money is when you don't need it. Uh, and we were able to do that. We advanced the feasibility study to where we're at uh, today. Uh, we're close to signing the contract to start the construction of the demonstration plant. And we've, uh, we've sorted out the metallurgy uh, of, this, uh, of this product, which has been challenging. Uh, I don't know if, you, if you're completely aware, but our process is going to be unique in terms of producing the, uh, the HP MSN. We're taking the ore directly, and we're going to leach it uh, and process it to produce the salt directly. There's going to be no calcining. We're not going to produce a metal and then further dissolve it into the HP MSN. It is going directly from ore into the salt. So um, the metallurgy and the, f the flow sheet around that was, was pretty intense. We spent over 5,000 man hours just on the, uh, on the processing side of it. Uh, we've done 80, almost 80 separate metallurgical tests uh, that we, uh, throughout this period. So all of that progress throughout the past year has allowed us to get to the point where we're able to make firm deposits on these crystallizers that we need for the demonstration plant because it's a critical piece of the IP and the technology that we need to produce this directly from ore. Yeah, and it obviously sounds as though that being able to produce straight from ore is also something that's going to keep costs lower, which obviously is, is a great thing. There's a number of things. Certainly it's going to keep our, our costs lower. It means it it'll, it'll, uh, will require less reagents but it also will result in a product that has a much lower carbon footprint and ESG and, and uh, is an incredible, incredibly important part of this entire EV transition that we're all being, uh, that we're all part of. So um, we're very keen uh, on the ability that we'll have to produce not only a quality premium product, but also an ESG premium product that's going to be able to provide the transparency that OEMs need uh, in their supply chain for their battery materials. Okay, and what about looking forward over the next 12 months? What should investors be keeping an eye out for in terms of things that are going to add value and, and help progress the project? Sure, the, the immediate would be the uh, what happens with the warrants that are expiring this, this week. Yep. Um, if they're exercised, it'll bring in some additional treasury and take away some of that overhang. If, they're, if they expire without being exercised, it takes away about 19 million warrants, which has probably been a bit of a drag on our share price, out of a float of about 208 million shares outstanding. So that's something that uh, we're, we're, we're keenly watching. Uh, certainly the release of our feasibility study later this year, um, as well as the commencement of the construction of the demonstration plant in, uh, in South Africa. But uh, I mentioned Otse earlier. Uh, we've finished our exploration drilling there, and we are hoping, uh, we are working towards releasing our maiden uh, resource for the Otse prospect, and we expect that to be as good as Cahill in terms of grade, which is at 19.3, or higher. We expect it to be higher. Based on the preliminary uh, results that we've seen, we've had some hits that are in excess of 60% uh, manganese oxide, so we're incredibly excited about what Otse can do to the economics of the company. Brilliant. All right, well, we'll keep up to date, and um, it's been a pleasure having a chat with you. Yeah, great to meet you. Thank you.